Okay, folks, let's uh, get started. Uh, we're talking here about the Constitutional Sixth Amendment standard for effective assistance of counsel. Uh, as you know, the Sixth Amendment requires the presence of counsel, including appointed counsel in some cases and at some points in the proceedings. But it's not just breathing, living body. It's effective counsel that the Sixth Amendment requires, at least up to a point. Uh, we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the uh, Strickland v. Washington standard here, established in 1984. Now, the Sixth Amendment standard uh, goes back earlier than 1984. Uh, it goes back at least as early as 1932, Powell versus Alabama, where you may remember that, the, uh, that there was actually a lawyer present in the courtroom on the day of trial, uh, but he had just arrived. He had not met his clients. He was, uh, was ill-prepared and said so and said, I don't think trial should go forward, but the judge said full steam ahead. And the Supreme Court, even though an attorney was there, said, we're going to treat this as if no attorney was present. But it's 1984 when the court in Strickland v. Washington first declares exactly what that, uh, what that standard for effectiveness will be. Now, I'm going to talk here about the constitutional standard, uh, but we'll also uh, be thinking together about the interaction between this constitutional standard and the statutory standards, the funding laws, uh, the actions of lots of different institutions in trying to uh, create, uh, trying to encourage effective assistance of counsel. So let's jump in. Uh, we've got uh, David Washington uh, accused and convicted of three different groups of brutal crimes spread over 10 days. Uh, initially, uh, Washington confesses to one of three murders. Then we've got experienced counsel who's appointed. He's pursuing pretrial motions and discovery, but then, says the attorney, a sense of hopelessness takes hold because the client ignores the lawyer's advice, confesses to the first two murders, also waives trial, waives the advisory sentencing jury, all against his advice. So the client has really undermined him, but there's still some things left to do. As Part of preparation for the sentencing hearing, the lawyer talked to the client, talked by phone to the mother and wife, but doesn't really follow up after one attempt at a meeting fails. There's no psychiatric evaluation requested because the attorney says there was no indication of a need for one. The lawyer does get the rap sheet excluded, doesn't request a pre-sentence investigation because that would bring in the criminal history and then argues to the judge that acceptance of responsibility should mean uh, no death penalty here. The judge had some history of, of uh, some reputation for uh, being amenable to this argument. The judge bought none of it, sentences Washington to three death penalties. Uh, Washington is claiming here that what the attorney did and didn't do put together amounted to ineffective assistance of counsel and therefore a violation of the Sixth Amendment that should overturn the validity of this conviction and sentence. The court's holding here is that there's no constitutional problem with the adequacy of counsel in this case and so the conviction and sentence can stand. The standard that the court announces has two parts as we see here. You have to show some kind of inadequate performance plus you have to show some kind of prejudice to the outcome uh, for the defendant. How could it take until 1984 for the Supreme Court to elaborate on the meaning of actual ineffectiveness of counsel? You do have to remember that Gideon wasn't decided until 1963, so roughly 20 years had been going by uh, since, uh, since counsel had been present in a wide range of cases. You should also be aware that lower courts were percolating on this question, developing their own various versions of, uh, of standards for effective counsel. First, the performance prompt. The, uh, the court says that the attorney violates the Sixth Amendment if that attorney fails to act as counsel within the meaning of the Sixth Amendment, and that means following, falling below some objective standard of reasonableness. Now, what does the court mean by objective? Well, that means you're not focusing on what this particular attorney is capable of, uh, but you're comparing this attorney to others. So it raises the obvious question, well, to whom? Who's the comparison group? The court really doesn't uh, pursue that question very much, leaving it for other courts later on to work out. So we don't know what yet whether it's all attorneys or Perhaps the comparison group is all criminal attorneys, or maybe it's criminal attorneys in this jurisdiction, or maybe it's capital specialists. So you can imagine several different comparison groups. 
Uh, but the point of the standard is that it's objective and therefore comparative to what other attorneys uh, do. Uh, the opinion uh, in part three also really stresses uh, that this is going to be a rare finding. It's going to be a rare event when a court declares on a constitutional basis that the attorney was constitutionally insufficient or inadequate. You see here three different uh, presumptions that the court is going to use in evaluating attorney performance. Uh, and the basic idea is this is going to be a rare outcome. So the first presumption is that the, the legal profession itself is going to have uh, safeguards in place so that the courts will get involved only on a rare basis. The court also uh, says we're going to try to eliminate the use of hindsight. Uh, we want, we're going to uh, presume that there are certain things that we see now that we couldn't see then, but that we're, gonna, we're just going to ignore those uh, distorting effects of hindsight. Uh, and finally, the court says, in general, we're going to treat this as a range of conduct, not a particular uh, set of tasks that the attorney has to uh, achieve, but a range of reasonable conduct. And most cases, the court says, fall within that range of reasonable professional assistance. Now, Justice O'Connor says that more specific guidelines aren't appropriate treats the prevailing norms of the practice like the ABA standards as only guides, uh, not a bare minimum that one must uh, rise above. Uh, in part, uh, the opinion says it's because the Sixth Amendment text refers simply to counsel and not to any uh, particular requirements for a counsel. Basically, the court is saying being an attorney is more of an art than a technical expertise. Being an effective attorney looks very different in different cases. That's the vision of lawyering that the, that the court is uh, embracing here. Uh, the alternative pressed by Justice Marshall is that, yes, uh, being an attorney is an art and it's going to look different in different cases, but there are also some, uh, some bare minimum preliminary requirements. There might be a checklist, at least for the early obvious things, and then after that you can add on the art. In part 3b of the opinion, uh, the court talks about the second requirement, the prejudice requirement. This is essentially a causation element. You have to show that the substandard performance of the attorney caused some harm to the uh, to the defendant. That is, it, there was some prejudice to their case. Now, there are a few settings, the court says, where prejudice is presumed, where the defendant doesn't have to prove anything. For instance, if the state completely denies counsel to a defendant, or if there's a conflict of interest, the court says there may be some presumed prejudice. Outside of that context, we're talking about uh, actual ineffectiveness, and the defendant has to prove some kind of prejudice in that setting. So, how certain does the fact finder have to be that some kind of harm to the defendant happened? Uh, we've got a few possibilities that the court talks about. You could think of this as running on a scale from 0% likelihood to 100% likelihood, with 50% uh, right in the middle, 100% at the top, 0 down at the bottom. And the court says it's going to be in a range down here below 50% somewhere. So, in, you know, specifically, the court says you don't have to show that it's 50 plus percent likely. You don't have to prove that it's more likely than not that the attorney error caused some kind of disadvantage to the defendant uh, for the uh, conviction or the sentence. Uh, at the bottom end of the scale, you do have to show that it's something uh, more than just some conceivable effect on the outcome. The court would really not place this in numerical terms, but let's say it's more than a 5 or 10% uh, likelihood. We're talking about a, uh, an outcome in between this top and bottom bound. The defendant has to show a reasonable likelihood that the outcome would have been different. Just to be facetious and overly specific, let's say it's got to be somewhere between 11% and 49% likely. Uh, certainly, it's got to be a probability sufficient to undermine confidence in the outcome, says the court. Let's think a little bit about the general virtues of this standard. In Strickland, the Supreme Court is saying that they need not to be the leading actor in deciding on uh, the quality of counsel. Uh, and they do stress the need for a flexible standard that accounts for all the variety that one sees in uh, good and acceptable lawyering. And the basic focus, says the court, should remain on the adversarial testing process. It's not so much was there one error, but 
is this lawyer contributing to some kind of legitimate criminal process? There are several weaker aspects of this Strickland standard, as uh, pointed out in Justice Marshall's uh, dissent. Uh, for one thing, there's not much of a requirement here. The, the appellate role is quite minimal. Certainly the Supreme Court's role is quite minimal, and even the role for intermediate appellate courts is not going to be uh, terribly assertive here. It does, uh, this standard does allow for some further development of the, of the uh, precise contours by uh, intermediate appellate courts on questions such as the relevant comparison pool. But uh, Justice Marshall says a lot of the language in this opinion uh, that talks so much about how it's uh, awfully hard to predict what good lawyering looks like will discourage the development of meaningful standards uh, over time. And finally, let me mention something about the uh, the different eras of Supreme Court opinions in this, uh, in this area. When it comes to applying the Strickland standard, uh, we've seen some differences over time. The early case law all focused on choices by counsel at trial or perhaps in a sentencing uh, proceeding, especially in a capital sentencing proceeding, and in that setting the court has been quite reluctant to uh, uh, to declare either that there was prejudice or a performance problem based on the uh, on the attorney's choices in the heat of the moment when things are happening quickly at trial. Uh, the defendant normally loses here because the court says we can imaginatively reconstruct what the attorney might have been thinking or what the attorney might have hoped to accomplish here. We can imagine a reason for doing this, therefore case affirmed, conviction affirmed, sentence confirmed. On the other hand, when you shift away from the, from the quick, on-the-spot choices being made at trial or in a sentencing proceeding, and instead you focus on the pretrial preparation process, do you even investigate a potential claim? There the court has been a little bit more willing to declare that there was some prejudice and some kind of performance uh, shortcoming, uh, because in these cases it really you can't make a, uh, a considered choice at trial unless you've explored some of the options pre-trial. If you never even investigated an option, then it may not be reasonable to reject that option in favor of something else. And most recently, in what I call Era 3 here, the court has been very interested in the activities of the attorney as a counselor to the client and as a negotiator of, of a, a possible guilty plea, uh, as in Padilla versus Kentucky that dealt with uh, advice to the client about immigration matters, where the court said there was potential uh, uh, ineffective assistance of counsel and giving bad advice about immigration matters. And in uh, the uh, cases Lafler v. Cooper and uh, Missouri v. Fry from 2012, uh, the court said that, uh, that the defendant could be uh, prejudiced by poor advice in the plea negotiation process, even if there is a uh, constitutionally adequate trial after the fact, or even if the defendant accepts some less advantageous uh, plea offer later on. The later plea offer or the later trial don't cure the error in the early negotiation because uh, the defendant realistically ended up worse off than, uh, than he or she would have uh, if the attorney had given proper plea bargaining advice uh, at the start of the uh, of the negotiation process. So we've got the court a little bit more willing to uh, to jump into what in effect is the most important function of the uh, of the trial attorney in a world where trials are far less common than negotiated pleas of guilt. Okay, there are a huge number of other questions uh, that are involved in applying the Strickland standard. Uh, and so we've just uh, covered the basic holding here and some of the initial questions about how it plays out on the ground. Uh, we'll continue to talk about those, uh, those on the ground questions when we get together next time. So see you then.